you're a born again believer in the house of the Lord today, you ought to be grinning from ear to ear. To be reminded that this world is not our home. We're just passing through. Oh, God told Abraham, don't put up tents. I mean, don't put up houses. Don't build houses. Just, just put up tents. Because <laughs> you're just passing through. Amen? We're just sojourners passing through this world, man. Don't get used to it. Don't fall in love with it. Because we have another home. Amen? Amen. Built with his hand. Man, if you're not born again today, the Lord's going to give you an opportunity to get that right today. And I pray that you take advantage of that opportunity. Or as the old saying says, if it doesn't put a smile on your face, then your wood's wet, right? If that don't light your fire, yeah. wood's wet. <laughs> John chapter 8. Let's all turn there this morning. John chapter 8. And we're going to read the first 12 verses of John chapter 8. And we're going to see here where Jesus forgives an adulterous woman. And see what we can learn about him. John chapter 8 beginning in verse 1. The word of the Lord says. Jesus went into the Mount of Olives. And early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. You, you know what I've always had trouble with there? I'm thinking about how did these how did these guys catch her in the act? I mean, were they a bunch of peeping toms or what? You know, how did they know, right? <laughs> it's always puzzled me there. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what sayest thou? And they this they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin. No more. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word this morning. Father, from the truth that we find in it, from the encouragement that we find in it. Father, for Jesus the light of the world. Father, my prayer is this morning, if there's any amongst us that is still walking in the darkness, God, that today they choose to come to the light and walk in the light and experience the light that is the life of men. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, Again, we started uh, last week the I Am series where uh, Jesus basically reveals himself as the eternal Son of God. I mean, the I Am statements, they help us to understand. And, and last week we looked at the bread of life. And uh, if you'll remember, we discovered, first of all, that what that meant was that he was the source of life. And that number two, he was the sustainer of life. And number three, that he brings satisfaction 
to life. You remember what he said? If, if, you, if you come and partake of the bread of life, you shall never thirst again. You shall never hunger again. What he satisfies us to the full. Well, this morning, what, what does the light of the world mean? What does this I am statement mean? And how does it relate to you and me? Well, that's what we're going to uh, examine this morning. And the first thing that I see, uh, our text here relates to you and me because it reminds us that light brings a knowledge of our need. Let me say that again. Light brings a knowledge of of our need, and we see that there in the first nine verses. Notice the word then in verse 12. It says then, and that's referring to the previous experience, everything that had happened in the verses before. So let's talk about it. We see here what? The woman taken in adultery. And notice too that all eyes are focused on this guilty woman. She and Jesus, have, I mean, they've drawn a crowd, right? Jesus was just there to, to teach in the temple, and she was out doing her thing, and apparently, like I said, there must have been a bunch of peeping toms out there that caught her in the very act and brought her to Jesus for the sole purpose of trying to catch Jesus in heresy. And so what we see here, all eyes are focused on this lady and on Jesus. And here the Pharisees are basically, again, just trying to catch Jesus between law and grace. They're, they're, they're trying and hoping to, to catch him in a trap, trying to catch him in heresy. I mean, uh, aren't you going to uphold the law, Jesus? And if you remember... At one point, Jesus said, I have come to fulfill the law, right? I've come to fulfill it. And so much so that Jesus went as far as to say things like, you know, uh, that the, the commandments or the law says, thou shalt not commit adultery, but I say unto you, right? If you even so look upon a woman with lust in your heart, you've already committed adultery in your heart went on to say the word, the, the commandment says, thou shalt not murder, but I say unto you. <clears throat> if you even hate a brother in your heart, you've already committed murder in your heart. Sounds to me like Jesus is fulfilling the law, right? Going even up and above and beyond the law. And so I mean, what Jesus is trying to do, man, is say, look, the law, I've come to fulfill it in me. You're going to know the law. You're going to have the law in your heart. You don't even need the law written down anymore because I'm going to place it in your heart. It's where you don't do those things of darkness anymore. So here's the big question. You know, if he came to fulfill the law, but we also know that he is a friend of sinners. You remember him being accused of that by the Pharisees? Who is this man, <laughs> you know, that, that's a friend of sinners? Well, what did the law demand for adultery? The law demanded death, didn't it, for adultery? That they should be stoned to death. So here's the big question. If you ever ask this, what would Jesus do, right? That's the big question of the day. What is Jesus going to do? That's the big question. Well, Jesus stooped and he began writing on the ground. Now remember, the law had been written in stone for Moses, right? There's a lot of debate about this. What was Jesus writing in the ground? When, when I think about the law being written in stone for Moses, it makes me wonder that perhaps he wrote the commandments in the same. Or even the names of those that he knew in that presence that had sin in their life, right? Which would have included who? Everybody, wouldn't it? Everybody who was there. So yeah, there's a lot of debate about what he was writing, but either one of those could make perfect sense for us today. But, but the truth is, 
The law makes us all face our sins. I mean, it's the law that makes us aware of our sins. It's the law that brings light to our sins. It's the law that brings us knowledge of our need for forgiveness of our sins in our life. I mean, without the law, we wouldn't even know we were doing wrong, right? So God gave us the law. But no doubt here, y'all, the, the Pharisees are now made aware of their sins. Whatever was being written in the sand, it made these Pharisees aware of their sins. Jesus said, let him that is without sin, what? Cast the first stone in verse 7. And what happened in verse 9? Look at it again. And they which heard it being convicted by their own conscience went out one by one, beginning at the eldest and to the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. Wow. So exposed to the light, they all departed. They all ran off, beginning from the eldest and to the least, the Bible says. Light. Jesus brings us to the knowledge of our need in life. And next, light brings hope to the hopeless. That's what light does. It brings hope. To the hopeless. Again there in verse 10. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman. He said unto her woman. Where are thine, those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? And she said no man Lord. And Jesus said unto her. Neither do I condemn thee. I mean no doubt the woman was guilty without hope. But now she would have hope. She would have forgiveness in Jesus Christ. He asked her, where are thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? And then Jesus said, neither do I condemn thee. In verse 11. Hear me this morning, church. Jesus is light for all who are in darkness. For every one of us, Jesus is the light of the world if we're in darkness of our sins. And listen, I said all. Don't mistake that. All. Jesus is light for all. Jesus is the day spring from on high. Look at Luke chapter 1, man. Though the tender mercy of our, through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us. Day spring brings light into our life. He, he's also the light for the Gentiles here in Luke chapter 2. A light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people, Israel. And, and then we see that he's the light that was the life of men in this next verse in John chapter 1. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, but the darkness comprehended it not. Well, what does that mean, Brother Jeff, that the, the darkness comprehended it not? Well, it can mean a couple of things. It, it can mean that, that the darkness by their own choice chose not to come to it, not to comprehend it, not to understand it. Or some people say that it could simply mean another definition of the word comprehend, which simply means that the darkness couldn't even overcome it. Overcome. The light is so bright that the darkness could not even overcome it. Listen, church, the light of the world is going to win. Amen? Amen. And when the light is shown, we either choose to come or we don't. But the light is going to win over darkness. 
So as we think about that today, I mean, listen, I mean, listen to think about our Lord's passion for the lost in the world just overwhelms me. I mean, the world was mentioned and it appears 77 times in John's gospel law. And of course, it's capsulized to its fullest in John chapter 3, verse 16. You know what it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but shall have everlasting. And so church, the, the adulteress deserved death, but she received life from the light of the world. I mean, she deserved to be condemned, but she received pardon from the light of the world. And you know what else light does? Light brings direction to those who are delivered. It really does. It brings direction to those who are delivered. Again, in verse 11, she said, No man, Lord. And Jesus answered and heard, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Notice, Jesus clearly told her, Go and sin no more. There in verse 12. And then he says, He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Brothers and sisters, these are directions for those who have been forgiven. Go and sin no more. If you're following me, you don't walk in darkness anymore. Listen, we need to know today that, that, that salvation is only the beginning. Good works come after salvation, not for salvation, but because of salvation. You're all familiar here with Ephesians chapter 2. But let's remind ourselves, for by grace are ye saved through faith. That not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto what church? Good works. Good works. Which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Salvation is just the beginning. From there, you and I have been created, and God has ordained for us to do good works i.e. to walk in the light no longer in the darkness to go and sin no more you see we're we're not to walk in darkness anymore we're to walk in the newness of life and that's what romans 6 4 tells us here therefore we are buried with him by baptism unto death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. If you're a born-again believer today, I pray that you follow the Lord in baptism. You followed his commandment to be baptized. If you haven't this morning, I want to suggest that you do that. It's his will for your life. He commanded us to do that. Go therefore to all the world, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's what he commanded us to do. But what does that do? One reason for baptism is not just number one for obedience to his command. Not just number two to be a witness to the world that, hey, my life has been changed. I'm saved. I'm born again. But number three, it symbolizes that fact that as we're going down, we're dying to the old way of life. As we're under the water, we're dead in Christ. And as we come back up, we're coming back up to walk in the newness of life. That's what God wants us to do. So I ask, how about you this morning? How about you? Are you forgiven? 
Are you saved? Are you walking in the newness of life? Because if not, I want you to know that the sinless Savior brings light and life to sinners. God wants you to come to Jesus by faith. To come out of darkness to the light of the world. Listen, when we do that, he will enable us to walk in his light. I pray you understand truth this morning that he did not come to condemn you. He came to save you. Not to condemn the world, but to save the world. I want to invite you in closing to turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 3. Go back with me just a little bit to chapter 3. If you remember, it's the chapter where Nicodemus had come to Jesus by night. He didn't want nobody else to know what he was doing. He comes to him by night. Lord, what must I do to inherit eternal life to the kingdom of God? What must I do to be saved? And Jesus said, you've got to be born again. You know, born of the Spirit. And then we find that verse we quoted a while ago, for God so loved the world, in verse 16, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But so many people quit there. I want to encourage you to look at verse 17 through 21. Just to back up what I just said, Jesus didn't come to condemn you. He came to save you. For God sent not his son into the world, verse 17, to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So the only way condemnation is going to come to you is how? If you choose not to believe on Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's the only way that condemnation will come unto you. In verse 19, he goes a little further. And this is the condemnation. That light is come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest their deeds should be reproved. But look at those who do come to the light. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. heard me say this before and this verse explains what I'm talking about God didn't choose to send anybody to hell what God does is he respects your choice to go there what did it say he didn't come to condemn you he came to save you But you choose hell when you choose to reject the light. That's what condemns you to hell. Your choice. God said, my will is that all come to repentance, right? That's what God said his will was. But God, because he's a just God, because he's a righteous God, he has to do what's right. Those who choose not to come to the light choose the destination of hell. But when we come to the light of the world, folks, we can have forgiveness. Amen. And we can go to that glorious home that Miss Linda so well sang about. That God's prepared for those who chose to come to the light. And so that's the invitation this morning. 
to choose to step out of darkness and into the light by choosing to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior because he is the light of the world. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as we come to this time in our service, this time of decision, this time of invitation, Father, you know our hearts. I don't know. But God, you know who's here this morning who may be lost. And so, Father, I just pray by the power of your Holy Spirit this morning that you just begin to draw that individual or those individuals who have not yet stepped out of darkness and chosen the light of the world, your Son, Jesus Christ, by faith. And Father, as you do the office work in each and every heart, God, we just trust that to you. But Father, my deepest prayer this morning is that we choose the light of the world and we choose to follow him and we choose to go and sin no more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.